there you go. Well, welcome everyone to the second of our Yarns and Yarns uh, Knitting and Storytelling Circle, uh, which spans the North. Um, we Our first one was a few months ago now, and it came from uh, Newfoundland. And uh, it was all, it was great fun, and we, we learned a lot. And I'm sure today it's going to be even more fun. We're going to learn even more uh, as the second um, e event is is coming from North Uist and from Norway. Um, so this in this session, um, it's going to be effectively run by uh, Meg Rogers from North Uist, and uh, she's going to talk to us about uh, her craft life in in North in Bernera, just off North Uist, and her life with wool and, and sheep. And then uh, there'll be the opportunity to ask questions of Meg. Uh, basically the chat, if you see the system online, you'll see there's a chat system. So if you have burning questions that you'd like uh, to ask and to have addressed, just stick them in the chat. And uh, myself uh, or uh, Laurie, who's also joining us, she, she's also with the University of the Arctic. We, we run this uh, um, a thematic network of island studies together and we're, we're both sort of involved in the yarns and yarns a project so she'll also be looking at the the mm. questions um and uh, so if you have questions for meg then after meg has talked uh, you know get ready and she, she'll she'll answer them and then after that we'll, we'll move to uh, monica and hege in norway we're very excited that they've uh, joined us uh, today and again questions for them in the chat that would be that'd be brilliant and then we return from a uh, Norway to the Outer Hebrides uh, with Dana who is uh, from Grimsby in the Outer Hebrides and she's going to talk to us uh, as well um, so there's lots to experience and lots to learn so just uh, sit back get your your needles and your your wool and start knitting have a cup of tea and uh, listen to um, our evening's chat. So with that, um, I'd like to just uh, introduce Meg. Hello, Meg, would you like to take over? Okay, thank you very much, Andrew, um, for this opportunity to, um, well, welcome everybody to the Hebrides, really. But um, I'm here with our local knitting group it has to be said that we normally meet in the pub over the road um, not that we down lots of pints but i think the um, the cake stall is a bit of a draw and um so we're not running the gauntlet of the cake stall today but instead we're here at Tykersova uh, museum and art gallery in Lochmadi, um kindly hosted by susanna bolton who's here with us this evening, and she's the Gaelic officer and communications officer at Tykersva. And um, this is a fantastic community run facility with cutting edge contemporary art and a wonderful museum. So we're very grateful that uh, Susanna has hosted us this evening and we have an owl. So apparently we have to all tweet at the owl and it will switch around and everybody can hear us talk. So. Um, so Susanna, if you wouldn't mind loading my presentation, I've got a beautiful assistant this evening. <laughs> so here we go. <clears throat> that's that's the already ready. gone from the wrong side. Okay, we'll that's just go to the start. Um, so while we're just setting up my uh, my slideshow, after my presentation, we will nip across to my friends in Osteroy at the museum, um, and we'll hear from Monica. Um, and then we'll hear for Hege, and then we'll come back here and we'll hear from Dana McPhee um, from Uist Wool at the Mill in Grimsby. So that's that's great. Um, and so this evening, uh, yeah, my name's Meg Roger and I, I run the business, the Berlin Yarn Company, um, and we'll also be hearing about my project out there, the Deep Minded. Okay, can everybody see the slides okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's not you showing know. at the moment. It was sharing a minute ago. You're not sharing okay. at the moment. Okay. I just want okay. to double check that that was working. Okay. Is that best? That's it. Yeah, thank That's you. Great. Okay. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. So, because I actually don't know who we're, what, 
who we're speaking to this evening. I'm assuming we're speaking to all around the North Atlantic and possibly further afield. It might be quite fun to see in the chat where everybody um, is connecting in from, but uh, not everybody knows the Hebrides. And um, so here's a little pin actually on the island of Burnery where I live, um, but we're only 10 miles away. So um, the pin's not that far off, but like ever, like so many people in this network, we are very much an isle, on an island and very much on the edge of the, the North Atlantic. So next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so with my family, I, I run a croft um, called Sunhill on Burnery, and we rear pedigree Hebridean sheep. Um, now, they're part of the North Atlantic sheep breed that you find all around the North Atlantic, as it happens, um, as far west as Greenland, um, but also as far east as Rush, parts of Russia, Norway, Iceland, Greenland, Faroes, uh, the Scottish islands to the north and west, and the Isle of Man. And um, while extensive genetic research hasn't been done on all the breeds, uh, there's a working assumption um, assumed by zoo archaeologists that the dispersal of the North Atlantic sheep breeds were most likely linked to um, the, the Norse people um, and how they moved across the, the, the North Atlantic. Um, so for the, these Vikings, for the Norse people, the, these North Atlantic sheep were not just a source of meat and wool, uh, meat, wool, and milk um, for for uh, food and clothing, but their their wool also was used to make the sails of their ships, and this was uh, clearly a very important means of their advancement across uh, the North Atlantic area. So, um, no, not quite. Next slide. Please. So, what we have here on the bottom left is a Berlin. Um, and this stone engraving is from uh, Rodel Chapel uh, over the other side of the Sand of Harris. Um, the, the stone carving dates to probably the mid 1500s, but clearly uh, the design was based on a, a Viking Nar longship. But once the, the longships um, arrived in the Hebrides, they had to be shortened for inter-island travel, and that's what became the Berlin. And it's interesting to think that um, even though the, the Vikings had left, essentially were no longer in power for 300 years after this date, that ship design was still very much being used then by the Lord of the Isles. So, and it's um, it's a really beautiful stone carving if you ever get the chance to see it. So. Uh, this is what I used for uh, the logo for my yarn company. And there you see the Berlin Yarn Company from Seafaring Sheep. And we'll come to that more in a little while. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. So here are other examples of North Atlantic sheep. Um, in the top left are North Ronald Sea, the seaweed nibbling North Ronald Sea sheep. And um, on the right are uh, Gamal Norsk Spel sheep. I probably haven't pronounced that correctly, but these belong to Berit Orthus in Osteroy in Norway. And then the bottom right, those who are um, up in Shetland, who may be listening in from Shetland, will recognise Vivica. So this is Rudale yarn. Um, and then on the bottom left is an Icelandic sheep in northern Iceland. Okay, next slide, please. And um, just to prove my point, our, our sheep are very much seafaring sheep. We like the, the sort of sense of history in that um, their ancestors were brought to the Hebrides in longboats by Vikings. And then we have the practice of, as a family, uh, we take our sheep to offshore islands. Um, here's actually my nephew Malcolm, who's just emigrated to Canada. So if 
anybody bumps into this young man <laughs> on the east coast of Canada, you can freak him out by saying Auntie Meg says hi. Um, but so here we are, we're, we're taking a mixture of lambs and some older ewes and we're taking them to offshore islands for uh, oh, this is how we wean the lambs and then they spend the winter out there. It's a, an old practice. The islands are part of our common grazing and there's only one other family that, that still uh, maintain the tradition. Okay, next slide, please. So this slide I like, um, this is uh, the first chart of the Sand Harris. It dates back to 1857. And uh, of course the islands haven't changed that much in 200 years, mm -hmm. uh, but you can see Burnery up in the north there, uh, northwest, and um, then down here, uh, bottom left are the islands where we, we take our sheep for, for, uh, for their grazing. But what's significant about this chart is that this 1857 was a period of time in the Highlands and Islands where we experienced the clearances. Um, and this was when um, the, the landlords that had previously been living with their, their tenants on the land were now in the main, living on the mainland. And it was a period of the, the Industrial Revolution, the peak of the colonial period, and they saw, they looked back at their lands and thought, well, if I just clear these pesky tenant, tenants off my, my land, I'll bring in Cheviot sheep and we'll establish big sheep farms and make a lot more money. And that's what happened. Um, often, very violently, people were cleared off their lands, and that's where many people left to go to Canada, Australia, and America. And I've no doubt that there will be people listening in this evening who were ancestors of those people that left. Now with them, when the land was cleared, that was when the little black Hebridean sheep were also cleared because their black fleeces were no good for the wool industry. And um, the Hebridean sheep pretty much dis disappeared from the highlands and islands. And um, it wasn't until around about the 1980s and 90s that they started uh, making a, a reappearance. Um, and yeah, I think we can have the next slide, please. And so we took on our croft and we took on our Hebridean, little flock of Hebridean sheep about 12 years ago. And in due course, my husband said, now you're gonna have to start doing something with these darn Hebridean sheep. And so I did my first uh, box of wool and got very excited about that. And one thing led to another. And now I run the Berlin Yarn Company. And so top left is the pure Hebridean uh, yarn. And I now work with quite a lot of the other crofters in, in my own locality. And bottom right is bog cotton, which is pure Cheviot. Um, so most of the wool I'm able to get within a uh, within about 20 miles of my croft and um, it's really nice to be working with the crofters on first name terms and all of that. So next slide please. So uh, yeah, I, I now blend, we blend the Hebridean and the Cheviot to get two grades of grey and then we go through a certified uh, organic dye process um, to get a range of colours. And um, I do like to take my inspiration from the land and ski seascape of the Hebrides. So um, that's the background between Berlin Yarn Company. OK, um, next slide, please. Uh, so just I think just a little bit more context on the Norse culture and heritage in our islands, because um, this will explain what my, what I did next. Um, so when the Lord of the Isles uh, swept away a lot of the Norse culture, but it's still very much part of our, our landscape here. Um, many of our place names and certainly majority of our islands still retain their Norse names. And if you speak to any of the, the uh, fishermen, they'll tell you that uh, the, in, in the main, their seafaring terms are 
have their origin in Norse, which I think is really interesting. That you know that goes back a long, long way, and yet it still prevails in the Gaelic language. But I would be interested to hear if there are any specialists um, online this evening, and I'm sure there are. That recently, I think it's it's been discovered that there's a lot more Gaelic in Icelandic than was previously thought. And it might be interesting to to hear a bit more about that because I haven't had the opportunity to research it further. So next slide, please. So mixed in with this is the fact that I'm also an, an artist. And in fact, I did my degree in this very building with UHI. And we're sitting in one of UHI studios this evening. And if you ever are tempted by doing a degree course, I would definitely recommend it. And um, so I uh, work with the environmental qualities of, of the elemental qualities of, of the Hebrides, the, the wind, I make wind drawings and light and all sorts of other bonkers things that seems to, to work somehow. But um, so thinking about these two aspects of running the croft and wool business and working with yarn and wool and sheep, this led me to um, uh, an art residency up in the textile centre up in Blondis in the north of Iceland. And again, I would very much recommend it. Um, I went off in February and my husband said, what on earth are you doing going to Iceland in February? And I loved it. Everything was icy and snowy and slippery and it was just great. And um, I, I also spent a bit of time visiting um, the, the, the sheep farms in Iceland. It was very interesting for me because uh, here, uh, the Hebridean sheep is like this quirky curio, whereas in Iceland, it is the only breed that that you rear in Iceland. So that was really interesting to learn about your selective breeding and just all your animal husbandry and coping with very extreme environments. So that for me was, was a really interesting time. Um, while I was there, I uh, was introduced to the Varafelde, which um, we will talk about a lot more. Monica is going to tell you all about them. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Um, but that's bottom left. It's uh, It was made by the Vikings and it, it is made with the properties of the North Atlantic sheep fleece. Now, at North, North Atlantic sheep, one of the defining features that they do all share is a double layered fleece. So they have you have the, the outer layer, which on a Hebridean sheep, the, the staple can be as long as three to 37 centimeters, which is extremely long. And you can separate it out from um, an under layer, which is insulating and almost quite felted. So um, the Varafelder cloak works with these very long fibers and you weave it on a warp weighted loom and it's, it gives you this sort of fantastic uh, fur cloak look type garment. Okay, so while I was in Iceland, um, one of the things I was educated on was that I hadn't been aware of before uh, was the very strong links between Iceland and the Hebrides. Um, now, my understanding is that uh, through genetic research, DNA research, We've established that while 80% of the settling males were from Norway, the majority of the settling females were Celtic. And um, as is indicated in the, the book of settlements, Lamnabok, most likely the majority of them came from the Hebrides. And this was something I, I hadn't been aware of before. Um, and certainly in Iceland, I was educated by the fact that uh, they refer to the Hebrides as the Sudrera. I won't have said that properly, but anyway, my apologies. But the, the southern islands, inferring that from from where they came. So this was uh, this got me very excited. The fact that there was this very direct link between the Hebrides and Iceland. Now. Over and above that, I came across uh, the, the story of Althur, the deep-minded. Um, now, little girls grow up 
on the story of Aud. Um, and she is a very important female figure to a lot of Icelandic women. Um, and so I was very inspired by Aldo's story. I felt that um, her tale was as relevant today as it was when it was first written down. And um, basically, uh, Aldo, as a young woman, she left um, northwest Norway with her father, Kettle Flatnose, um, who was sent by King Harold to Scotland and the Hebrides to take control and to start sending um, booty back to Norway. Well, Kettle set off and he arrived in Scotland and he had absolutely no intention of sending anything back to King Harold. And what happened was that he took control of the Western seaboard and the Hebrides. And Auder eventually, she became part of one of the, the biggest, most powerful Viking dynasties of that period of time. She had a son with Olaf the White from Dublin and her son Torstein in due course took over, um, you know, the, the control of, of the Hebrides and large parts of Scotland. Um, however, these men led quite violent lives. Um, by contrast, Auder had come into contact with the teachings of Iona and had uh, converted to Christianity. Um, eventually, all her, her men folk were, were killed and she found herself in Caithness, um, probably quite vulnerable because she was now in like a power vacuum. And so she had a, a ship built uh, in secret in the woods, the saga tells, um, and she gathered together the remains of her family um, and other noblemen and slaves and her granddaughters, and she set sail captaining her own uh, vessel to Iceland. And of course, en route, she married off a granddaughter or two in Orkney and Faroes just to keep the politics straight. And once she arrived in, in Iceland, um, she was one of the few women to claim settlement lands in her own right. And in due course, she um, divvied up her land amongst the people that she traveled with, and she made her slaves free uh, people of Iceland. Um, now, on her, on her, just before she died, um, she, interestingly, to the audience here, certainly, her grandson, Olaf, Phelan married Alfdis, the Barra woman. And I think that's just a reflection of how interesting it is that the connection, the direct connection. Barra is an island of South Uist here. Um, so there we see the direct Hebrides Iceland connection. So um, I just felt that Outer Story was. Uh, really relevant to a contemporary audience and I it linked together many many aspects of many interesting aspects of who I am with seafaring and sheep um, and so I came home all fired up that um, that was it I was going to have an exhibition all about Auder and I was going to make her Varafelda cloak next slide please so um so I gathered together uh, many different North Atlantic sheep fleeces. Um, and here are some of the people that, that gave me fleece to work with. So um, Istex is the main uh, yarn producer um, and the, the textile centre just happened to be next door to one of their main processing um, plants. And then there's Dorothea Jansson from, uh, from the Faroes and again Vivica from Uradale Yarn. Next slide, please. Um, North Ronaldsea, and then Lofoten Wool and, and Berit in Osteroy. So we so in the Varafelda, I can actually we can go to the next slide, please. Um, where all those North Atlantic uh, fleeces. So the only challenge was firstly, Ty Crisper had actually offered me exhibition dates, so there was no backing out. Um, <laughs> The only problem was that I actually had never done any weaving in my life before, um, uh, yet alone ever made a Varafelder 
Um, so thankfully, Osteroy Museum came um, to the help. I contacted Solve Jordal at Osteroy Museum and she very kindly said, sure, come, we'll, we'll put you up um, and we'll teach you how to make a varifel. The, but what we'd really like is that your exhibition will come back um, and we'll, we'll show it here at Osteroy Museum. Well, what kind of an offer was that? That just sounded fantastic. So off I went to Osteroy and I'll have the next slide, please. Um, and I was very lucky because it was in February 2020. And here I am in Osteroy and I'm not going to talk too much about it because Monica is going to tell you all about the Vedafeld, but here I am just about to start and you can see all the fibres laid out. So the dark fibres are from my own Hebridean sheep and then the brown, rusty brown fibres are from Fairways fleece. And then we move into Norwegian and then the, the white ones are from Iceland and then the little soft fluffy ones on the end, they're both Shetland and North Ronaldsea. Now, it was really interesting to work across all the different fleeces and see the different properties that the different sheep fleeces had. And you can see that the Hebrideans are very long, mm -hmm. as are the Faroes and the Norwegians. And then we go to the really soft, fluffy, fluffy Shetland and North Romsey that actually were quite hard to work with because they were so short and soft and fluffy. But there we are, we better not promote them too much. <laughs> anyway, right, next slide, please. And here I am. So. Uh, yeah, I spent three, four weeks in Osteroy making my Varafelder fleece and then darn old COVID struck and I had to gallop home. But I got home and I'm very grateful for my time in Osteroy. And here I am wearing the Varafelder cloak um, on the west side of, of Burnery. Um, so in over the, the summer months, um, working with Andy McKinnon from US Film, who's based here at Ty Kursva, I invited women in the US to be filmed and photographed wearing the Varafelder cloak within a space in the landscape where they felt a strong connection. Um, part of the process during each photo shoot, um, and something I hadn't actually necessarily anticipated was that when we walked or when we were setting up the photo shoot, I would retell the saga of Aldo um, in, to ensure they understood what, what this crazy thing was all about. But actually what we found next slide, please, was that by the end of, of telling the story, they felt so caught up in the story and that feeling of fe strong female leadership and and how iconic she was, next slide please, that, um, you know, they, they felt like outer when they put the cloak on, or they felt, certainly felt a strong connection. And we had a, we actually had a lot of fun and it was a great way of, I mean, I think there were, there was about sort of almost 20 women that I worked with that summer. And uh, it was a great way of, retelling the Norse heritage and getting people to think about um, the Norse heritage of the Hebrides and these connections with Iceland. And um, so next slide, please. Um, and I think the fun thing was there was a bit of dressing up involved. And unlike um, our, our girlfriends in Norway and Iceland and Shetland, we actually don't get to dress up as um, Viking shield women very often. So we, we thought that was quite cool. Um, so final slide. So this is my show uh, set up in Tykersva and you can see all the, the photographs uh, and there, there was a film made. Um, if you're interested to find out a bit more, you can look up megroger.com and Andy and I, well, I think it actually was a very beautiful film we made and Johanna up from the, the textile centre, she actually read uh, the sections of uh, the Lax de la Saga relating to Auder in um, old Icelandic, I think, for the film. So that was that was a lovely touch. So also 
if anybody fancies having an exhibition, it's <laughs> it does tour. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, uh, great stuff, Meg. There are some questions in the in the chat. Um uh, people are, you know, most impressed with the, the Varafelder. Uh, one of the things that uh, Janet uh, says is that um, either of the deep minded was the first female Yarl. Uh, Leslie Simpson took on her role, first female Yarl of the South Mainland up here uh, in Shetland. And there's a, there's a link in the chat uh, to more information about that. Um, but yes, uh, there's some. Um, well, one question was how heavy is the cloak? Oh, well, <laughs> you know, I've never weighed it, but I think. Probably a kilo and a half, two kilos. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, a couple of kilos, maybe. Yeah. Right. Okay. We were just saying, don't don't put it near the biscuits because you can definitely tell that it's made from sheep. <laughs> <laughs> and while you've got it there, um, uh, Karen was wondering, what's the inside like? Okay. Okay. I was thinking, yeah, we could try it on. We'll take get rid of the scarf, and then um, so the inside. Monica will, yeah. So, can you see the inside? Oh yes. Monica will probably explain how it's constructed, <laughs> and also apologies, Monica, because it was the first one I made. So there's definitely bound to be mistakes, and um, but I think it's possibly unique in that it's made from so many different North Atlantic sheep breeds. Um, so in that respect. And it has sort of tested, you know, it does drop off a little bit, but, you know, it's been to Norway and back, so that's pretty good. And I have to admit that, you know, it does make for good wearing. It does. There you go. <laughs> Maybe not a, a garment to wear down to the supermarket, um, and it would really embarrass your teenage sons, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Anything else? Uh uh, yes, uh, Judith was wondering what, what was used for the warp. Right. Um, it was, it was, I just actually used a local Norwegian yarn. So, but again, Monica will, will help with that. I don't know if, yeah, it was, it was a local, um, Osteroy yarn even. So. Yeah. Hello, yeah, it's the old Norwegian uh, spell set. So it's the old uh, sheep. Great, there you are. That's your answer. Fantastic. Um, okay. Well, I think maybe people are holding their, their questions uh, for there's lots of comments about a brilliant project and. Uh, the uh, love the cloak images and oh yeah somebody wondered whether the clock was made from the fleece of all the different fleeces fleeces that you pictured. The clock. The clock. The clock. The clock. The clock. Oh uh, yeah, for, am I misreading it? Yeah, the, the, yes, I, I misread it. I, I was thinking. Oh, I, I don't remember the clock. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, the clock. The clock was definitely made from all the different fleeces. Yes. I also noticed somebody was asking about a film. So mm -hmm. yeah, if they go to my website and um, you can click on the picture of me wearing the cloak, you'll find the link to the film. It's about 20 minutes long. And um, though I say it myself, it is, it is very beautiful. And, and um, you can sit back and listen to the Laxdale saga with subtitles. <laughs> Have you tested it in all sorts of weather? Well, um, yeah, I mean, it, it did go out in all sorts of weather uh, because we were filming during COVID. And so we had to be quite strict in that we had a schedule. So we had to have three days between each photo shoot where somebody had worn it. And then we had to detox for three days. Amazing, the things we had to live with, wasn't it? <laughs> and we had to work outdoors. So we had to keep to the schedule. and. I do remember going swimming after a photo shoot <laughs> at that last photograph of the friend Ellis in the rock pools. We couldn't resist it. So we went swimming and it was kind of cold on the way back. So I ended up wearing it and it must have looked like some funny kind of a sheep. 
coming over the hill. So and it was really cozy. It's incredibly warm. And the thing is that because it's made of wool, it sheds the water and then it dries quite, quite easily. So, okay. We should maybe go on to Norway uh, yeah. and we can, we can have some time at the end. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, great stuff. Uh, yes, um, so let's, uh, let's go towards the north. And, yes. Uh, hello, Monica. Hello, uh, I will try to be here. Yes, can you see yes. it now? We certainly can. Good. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, it's very nice to be here with you. Uh, my name is uh, Monica, and I work as a textile uh, craft fan at Osterøy Museum. Uh, in um, Osterøy, it's just outside uh, Bergen, Norway. Uh, I will have a small talk about um, the textile varafell, a floss textile from Iceland. Osterøy Museum has for decades worked to ensure and uh, continuing the practical knowledge about the vark weighted loom and other historical uh, textile activities. Um, as a textile uh, worker and a weaver, I secure the knowledge and pass it on to new generations. The old textiles are woven on a work weighted loom, which is one of the oldest weaving looms we know of. It is assumed that the work weighted loom, also called Uppstagong, has been, ex, um, ex, uh, has been since the Stone Age. The loom stands up against the wall and the work treads are knotted to stones or ceramic weight at the bottom. The weight are often the only part of the loom found in archaeological digs. The work weighted loom was used in production of everything from clothes to sails. Uh, the museum uh, published a book about the work weighted loom in 2016. It was a cooperation between Hillur from Iceland Elizabeth from Shetland and Martha from Norway. As they were working on this book, they had a closer look into the floss fragment from Iceland, the Varafell, its history and the technique. Passing on the knowledge about this textile has become uh, one, an important part of the museum's agenda. This is the most documented archaeological find floss fragment in the North Atlantic Sea. This is the Varafell from Iceland. The piece is in the National Museum in Reykjavik. Varafell or Rogvarfeldur is a thousand year old commodity from Iceland. Trade between Norway and Iceland was common already in the Viking Age. From Iceland, we also bought vadmel. It was safe to trade with textiles. They could give an exact value. The weight and the size of the varafell was written down in the Icelandic law book, Grågos. Two L's wide and four L's long. In Iceland, the textile are called rögvarfellur, but when it became a trading com uh, uh, commodity, it's called Varafeldur. The Varafeld arrived in Norway on a trading ship from Iceland. Snorre, the Icelandic saga author, writes in his Konga saga about a ship sailing to Hadanger, loaded with Varafeldur. No one wanted to buy them until they asked the King Harald if he wanted one. He accepted the gift and it did not take long until all the Varafell was sold and the king got his name Harald Greyclock. 
There are, of course, uh, other theories about how it gets its name, but we choose this one. A varafel is a big wool wo uh, woven fleece. It looks like and has the same quality as a wool fleece. And, be and because of its weave, it can be bit much bigger than a fleece. Locks of the outer wool were knotted uh, from the Norwegian spencer, was knotted into um, to the warp as the fabric was woven. The wool has the unique uh, characteristic that it doesn't let the rain go into it. It just pour down out um, on the outside. People in Iceland and other places knew this and took advantage of it thousand years ago. So the Rogvefeller was worn as a mantle around the shoulder by herders, fishermen and Vikings on the ship. It protect the people against the rain and the cold. The design of the clothes, clothes, clothes was very important for our ancestor. It made it possible for them to live in this harsh climate here in the north and made it possible for them to go to sea and, uh, and out into the world. The floss technique takes us thousands of years back in time. Traveling has been quite common for mankind since early days. People always brought textiles and knowledge with them. In the North Atlantic area, the floss technique might be influenced from another place, but it also could be something which origin from the need of having protection against the, the cold climate here. Ostre Museum has been asked to participate in many exciting research and art projects. Uh, this is uh, one of this is the Meg's uh, project about the uh, Ord, the Deep Minded uh, exhibition last summer at the museum. I really like this picture of Meg in her varafel. And here is another exciting varafel project uh, we had in the loom. A pair of sleeves for the Norwegian artist Aurora, woven on the rough weighted loom, done as thousand years ago, and all craft used in a modern way. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Monica. Yes. Really interesting. Um, yeah. Well, do we have some some questions for 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 Monica? Um, well, just, it's just a matter of interest, uh, Monica, uh, what else does Osteroy uh, Museum do? Oh, yeah, lots of things. We, uh, <laughs> we, um, we take care of uh, the, the knowledge about the textiles uh, technique, the old one. So, and, and also it's uh, a lot of uh, weaving classes in the warp weighted loom. Uh, if, if, you, if you can see Solvay uh, here at the screen, you can also see the loom and you can see the okle and there's also a okle pattern there at, uh, at the end of the room. Uh, that's uh, a, a blanket from um, from Norway that uh, was on the bed to sleep on and to also have uh, over the body. Wonderful. It's uh, really colourful, beautiful. Um, yeah, we've got some questions coming in now uh, for you, Monica. Uh, sort of roughly how long does it take to weave a Varafelder? It takes a long. Uh, uh, Maggie used three weeks to, to make uh, hers and so uh, it, it takes a long time to prepare the wool uh, for uh, to weave. So it's like the same time to prepare the wool and to weave. Mm -hmm. You have you have to make this one first before starting to uh, to weave. So that takes also a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even the week I was working quite hard for three weeks, yes. morning till night three weeks weaving, but I had already prepared the wool before the, the, the togs before I arrived. So but I'm doing this because actually what you have to do is you, you have to join two together 
um, from the, the section that, that goes towards the skin, you put these two together and there's a little bit of spit, a, little, a lot of rubbing. I hadn't anticipated that I nearly got blisters. <laughs> <laughs> so. Do you think it might catch on here in Scotland? Hmm? Monica made these beautiful sleeves um, for the, the, well, she's a, a musician, she's a pop star in Norway, and um, it, it, it's very animal friendly, you know, so you're not dealing with leather or, or skin. Um, and also, it's probably easier to wear. Um, I, I think they're, they're I think there could be a, a use for it in contemporary fashion, definitely. I yeah. do, actually. And yeah, that, that was one of the questions. It was um, whether the cloaks are used in fashion today or, or just in museums and uh, um, arts yeah. exhibitions. No, yeah, the people use it in, in fashion. Uh, the, the, um, the jacket we made for Aurora, we also made uh, a, uh, a similar jacket uh, for uh, uh, the uh, designer team, and so I, I hope some people are going with that jacket around. Uh... <laughs> there's a there's an interesting question here from Joyce. Uh, because the Varafeld, it looks like a, a sheep's fleece. Um, she's asking, what's the advantage of adding the step of weaving the fleece as opposed to just skinning the animals and wearing that? Yes, uh, the fleece will be much bigger than. Uh, uh, a fleece direct from the sheep, and also when it, that uh, will become wet, it will be very stiff and hard. But the the varafel direct from the loom will be soft and dry uh, more easy, easily. That's, yeah, good to know. Um, and a, well, there's another couple of questions here. A, did both men and women wear them? I, I I think so, but but we don't know uh, if it was uh, only a man or only a woman. Um, but I think so. I'm pretty sure Alba will have worn one. <laughs> they remind me of uh, some of these costumes that um, shepherds in um, sort of mountain areas and, and areas like Hungary and things. It where is there a link there between the uh, between them? Yeah, I I think it's uh, it's a link. M maybe it uh, came from that area or the same place, or uh, maybe as a as a textiles, but also as a, a technique or something that uh, some people had seen, and and it will um, involve to uh, the textiles, the varafel. But um, we don't know if there are been uh, from one place or uh, popped up uh, several places at the same time. Yeah, I see. Um, well, uh, Andrea is wondering, is it woven in one piece? Yes, it's woven in one piece. It's uh, the woven, um, it's you can have one and uh, yeah, almost one and a half meter. Wow. Yeah. My goodness, the questions are, are mounting up here. <laughs> I'm, I'm way <laughs> behind. Uh, let's see. Okay, right. Uh, let's see. Uh, wait, is um is the wool that's used? Is it still greasy when you use it, or do you sour it first? No, it's uh, direct from the sheep. So, so you have the lanolin and everything in it. It's very nice to work with when the, it's uh, the lanolin in it. But after it's finished, uh, we uh, wash it. So it's direct from the sheep. <laughs> and um, oh, uh, same as wondering, are there any pics, pictures of a project in, in process? Um, so it's actually taking place, so part way done. Is there anything? Do you have anything in the museum, like a uh, pictures in a web on a website or something showing it, showing the process? Um, yes, we we have a film uh, about the whole pro uh, process. You can go into our uh, uh, website and and find it uh, there. 
Fantastic. Okay, yeah. definitely do that. Um, okay. Um, was it ever used as a blanket? There you go. Yes, um, that kind of textiles, um, the floss textiles, are uh, we have now and have in history. You can use it as a blanket to have over you and also to lie on. Uh, in, and in Norway, we also have the boat rug that's uh, similar to uh, the Varafell. That's have uh, treads with and and not uh, the wool, but it's um, it's the same. It's to have in in the bed also. Okay, well, fantastic. Uh, well, some of the questions here, there's, there's some others, and uh, people are thinking it looks like uh, something from the Game of Thrones. Well, of course, that was filmed uh, in Iceland, so that would that would make sense. And uh, the size of the cloak determined by the size of the loom. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And um, someone's asked about the breed of sheep, but we've, we've sort of already. Yeah, it's it's the that. it's the um, uh, the old Norwegian uh, spelser, or or wild sheep. You can also call the the short uh, tail. We know it's yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed, Monica. That's 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 great, brilliant, and so much information. And uh, I definitely want to have a look at the the film on the website. That that yes. sounds grand. Um, is that somewhere e easily accessible? Is it? Is yes, it you can uh, uh, go into Ostre Museum, and in in the bottom of the um, the website, you find a link to uh, uh, to the film. I don't know what it's called um, there, but, but maybe we can try to. Yes, well, I'll stick. I've, I've got the yeah. uh, the museum website here, so I'll put that in the, the chat, uh, so people can can have a look and uh, explore all the other things that you do there yeah. as well. Fantastic. That's brilliant. OK, well, staying in, in Norway, um, we'll move along to Hege. Hello, Hege. How are you? Hello. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you. Um, sorry about my English. I will try my best. <laughs> I'm Hege Nielsen. I work in uh, the Norwegian Handcraft Association in uh, Norway. And we have uh, uh, yeah, very strict bond to all the museums in Norway. And one of my favorite museums is Ostre. And uh, Solvay and Monica and Martha are all good friends. So, and we like to visit the museum. And I want to talk. I want to talk about um, their Sunday uh, Sunday jackets or Sunday uh, sweaters uh, in two bind two bind uh, knitting, and uh, twi or twine and knitting. We can call it. It's um, all traditional uh, uh, jackets or sweaters that were used. We use now uh, to na our national costume sometimes in some area, most of the western part of Norway. And um, I want to share my screen with you uh, if it's possible. I'm not so good at this, but we try. Um, uh, That's perfect. You can see it? Yes. It's okay. Can. Yeah. So uh, this is a sweater from Ustare. Uh, they have three of them. Oh, well, uh, actually, we just see the first slide, the two end knitting slide. Okay. Uh, so, so, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Um, can you see the next picture now? Uh, no, it's still still the same. The the first okay. slide. Maybe if you stop sharing and uh, and try again. Okay. I think something happened here. I'm so sorry. Um... It's okay. I'll just do this. Stop sharing. 
Yeah. I'll stop <laughs> my own sharing. <laughs> uh, there we go. So let me try again. So... Uh, I've never tried, I'd always use Zoom or something else. Um, can you see the second one now? Uh, no, not yet. No. Okay. Um, if you go to the share button, and there's a whole range of different things to to look at, which one did you press? Simon, what do I do here? Is, um, did you press the application or did you press the screen? I pressed the screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Hey, how big's the file? Uh, but maybe I can show it. We try something else. Um, okay. If I do just quit uh, sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, when this happens when I'm, I'm teaching people using VC, I just get them to send me the uh, yeah. the PowerPoint and then I run it and just I do what I'm told. Yeah. And just press but the I button. can show you on pictures. We try that. Okay. Uh, how can I stop sharing? Because okay. it disappeared. Uh, okay. I'll just do the yeah. same thing again and then I'll just stop sharing. How's yeah. that? Yes, then I just show you some pictures. Yes. In Ustare, maybe you can see here, you can see the, the sweater. Uh, yes. On top, it's blue with the uh, stars, or Otteblas Rosa, as we call it, eight leaf roses. And in the bottom, you can see it's white. And the white, in the beginning of the different uh, Sunday uh, sweaters, Sunday sweaters, we, we can find two and knitting. Then you start with cast on with three threads, not two, but three threads. So it gets uh, st is stiffer and it gets uh, more uh, hard to destroy. Uh, it's uh, used very often on sweaters and down on the sleeves and down on the bottom where you start and also on, on um, gloves like this. And uh, yes, so uh, it gets a more um, uh, it's you know so easy to destroy it, and when you knit to two and knitting, you always have at least two threads. So you take uh, you knit with one thread, and then you take the another the the next the thread before, and you knit with that one, and then you take the one. So so it was always you bind it, so it gets a round, um, good. Uh, I can show you here on my one of my socks. Can you see this? You can see there is uh, a lot uh, as a uh, yeah the, the, the threads lays on a uh, um, like a binding round and round and round. And some when they are knitting two and knitting, they twined the endings one way uh, at the first uh, round when they're knitting, and then they twined it the other way <laughs> on the next time so then the it goes loose all the uh, threads because when you are knitting two bind uh, uh, knitting you always get a mess if you don't get a mess you don't <laughs> uh, knit the correct way so uh, down on the on the beginnings of lots of sunday sweaters like the one on uh, i have to show you here uh, on the sunday uh, sweaters from Usre, you can see you and uh, you are twine bending with uh, one color, two threads, and it's only uh, four uh, 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 knit and four purl, and all the way you twine the thread. Uh, then you get a, a thicker uh, and a more st stable. Uh, kind of of uh, fabric, and we use it down uh, on the beginning of the gloves, 
And also I hear I have a jacket from um, for my national costumes costume. It's from uh, Fana, just out, uh, on the other side of Bergen, and it has two uh, bind knitting on the beginning of the sleeve and two bind knitting on top of the shoulder. Can you see it? And two bind knitting here down on the bottom. Oh, maybe there is some light. Can you see it? And it's. Uh, I prefer to to be uh, to do this in light uh, yarn because it's easier to see the pattern. So when it's black, it's almost impossible to see what you are doing. So a good advice: try everything in la uh, in light uh, color first. In the sweaters, there is often a, um, a yarn with the colors on top. Uh, and that's because the sheeps were colored. It's uh, and it was old Norwegian sheep or different kind of sheep they used. But in from the uh, um, yeah, don't know the jackets. They're white, and we have a lot of mystery about that part. Why are there lights on the on the bottom, like you saw in the picture? So I'll show you the picture again and. Uh, there's many theories, but I talked to one of uh, a good friend of mine who has been studying lots of Norwegian uh, knitting, and she said that uh, you can see I'll have to you can see here this is the white part, so it, the color stops by the navle. I don't know what do you call it by the waist and down it's white. So they said okay, it's because you put it down in your trousers so nobody would see it. That's not true because of some of the pictures you can see it outside of the trousers. And so said because it's uh, more cheap with white wool. But that, that's not true at all because the white wool was so difficult to find and to get. So it's more like a christening thing that everything below the waist the abdomen was nothing to talk about and it was supposed to be clean. So I think that's the most <laughs> sensible. Um, uh, yeah, but we can't go back and ask them. Uh, we should have, uh, there's lots of questions, but we should go back and ask them for. It. So the knitting came to Norway about the 1600, but uh, the common knitting was about the 1800. And we have a lots of different jackets and gloves and uh, sweaters with these two bind endings. And from Sweden, uh, uh, with the gun, also, where no way me Sweden, we see uh, a lot of gloves like this one here. Uh, this is the backward of the uh, glove when you knit it. I can show you uh, the right side. It looks like normal knitting. But when you twine it and then you when you have knitted it and it, you have made it almost finished, you put in uh, sometimes uh, we use that on the all the way from south to north. They use these gloves like this and put uh, uh, floss on it. So it's more like the, the Varafell as Monica, but it's an easier way to do it. They put uh, floss on the whole way and they made them very big and they put it in the water the salty water, and then they start working with the uh, fishing yarn and everything. So we're working gloves. So because it was two and knitting, it, they were solid and they will last longer. Uh, so um, I want to show you from Hardanga. Uh, these are knitted socks um, like this here. And uh, it's made on the needle one. Most of the jackets are made on needle uh, point two. Does that make sense? For, uh, uh, it's Norwegian how we we uh, measure the needles, the knitting needles. Yeah. So uh, this is um, here is up to five different colors in each part way you uh, each row. 
So then you have to 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 for each stitch you twine the thread you're using around all the stitches, all the threads. Sorry, and um, you have to straighten out the yarn because uh, if you have the wrong uh, twining on the yarn, it will loosen up. So it's easy to use the yarn that is uh, set and as twined. So if you have two different kinds, so if you spun it yourself, it's very it's easier to, to knit with it, but it's no problem to use normal yarn. It's no problem. So this is a, a sock from Hardanger and Voss uh, outside from yeah, an hour from Ustere and uh, used for the national costumes today. And um, yeah, I have uh, uh, some gloves. These gloves here are from Sweden and it's very similar to the bottom for, of, for our jackets and uh, but they use very often uh, light glove, uh, light colors. And you see this thread is very common on on all the uh, socks and the uh, gloves from Norway. So they could wash it or if it was wet, they hang it on by the door or they hang these socks here when, you know, they didn't have these roads we have today. They were in the forest and they were walking through the woods, coming to the church. And then they had these uh, socks hanging in their belts so it wouldn't get destroyed. So here is two by knitting down here, down to here, and it's normal knitting all the way here. And the same are for the jackets. It's in the beginning and the end. Uh, it's two by knitting and then it's no more knitting. So uh, it's very, very, I like, uh, I love to knit with thin, thin, thin needles. So um, this is, uh, it's, it takes a long time to do it, but it's very fun to do it. And I love the result. And if you uh, try to knit uh, pearl in twine banding and you knit and you do it uh, after each other, it's like a mysterium. You never know what's happening. So you think you're going to do that pattern and you think it's supposed to be like that. And then when you do it, it just turn out something else. So two eye by knitting is very fun if you use different colors. And um, um, I will show you, it fell on the floor, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a, a, a kind of a breed. Uh, we call it a twining breed in Norwegian, but if you want to uh, have a look at uh, YouTube or find it at YouTube, then you probably have to spell it uh, spell Latvian to breed, because it's common this uh, this uh, breed in Latvia. So uh, you see in Norway with Bergen, Ustre the ships were coming in. So I think we learned from each other because of all the way. Yeah, like the Varafel, there was a connection with all the other countries abroad. So uh, yeah, maybe you have some questions. Maybe you want to ask me something. Uh, we certainly do, Hege. Uh, <laughs> fantastic uh, materials you, you showed us there. In fact, that was, you know, who cares about the presentation? It was brilliant to see the, the actual garments, the actual <laughs> pictures themselves of things. That's that was uh, superb. Um, yes, there are questions. Um, I wonder, can you see the chat button yourself? Uh, yes. So if you click on that, you'll see that there's quite a lot of questions there. Uh, uh, the reason I say this is because it's tech. It seems like technical knitting yeah. questions, and it yeah. might be better. <laughs> <laughs> If you answered it directly, instead of it comes in my, sort of in my ear and out my mouth, there's something uh, uh, um, incorrect, as it were. So um, if you can see uh, the chat questions there, uh, the last one is about um, puffs in Newfoundland. Uh, Denise saying that they do uh, something similar in Newfoundland. Um, so I, I don't know uh, if you could maybe just work up and um, and see what people say. Um, yeah. 
if I can just show you a book, this is the only book that I have gotten uh, in this technique, and uh, it's uh, from Sweden. And I'll can I can put some of the, some links in the chat uh, for you uh, with this book and some other uh, names that if you want to look up and and want to see uh, different uh, techniques. The museum in Hardanger uh, has made. Um, uh, made this material package, how to make these with all the things in, but it's in Norwegian, so, but maybe you can, it can be translated. And Ostre Museum has also made uh, gloves uh, from an old gloves pattern. As an old gloves, they have made new patterns, so it's also available there. So, uh, yeah, I'm so sorry that my, my uh, PowerPoint didn't work, so thank you. Uh, don't have to worry about that at all. That that the the Hardanger um, pack, as it were, is that available online? Can people order yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. You okay. can order it at the Utne Museum in Hardanger. Yeah, and you can order. I think you can order, Monica. Can't you order uh, the gloves pattern in um, Ostre? Do you have the pattern for the gloves there as well? Yeah. Mm. Very nice gloves. Yeah. Wonderful. That's that sounds sounds good. Um, okay, well, if we just work through some of these questions, then, if you, uh, if you can, um, uh, Denise is wondering what size of size millimeter needle do you do you use for this technique? I've used from uh, zero seventy five to about two. Um, yeah, that's the most. I like needles from what uh, seven, uh, uh, seven, zero point seventy five to to one and a half that's the most uh, the one i like the most but it depends on the yarn uh the yarn here is from england uh, it's we it's called also used from for weaving bells for the national costume of telemark and uh, i hold uh, the, the yarn down here is from hillesvog and it's norwegian wool uh, and uh, i've used a, a bit of swedish wool as well uh, so i like the norwegian uh, or then north uh, sheeps because it's um, you know it's curly and it's it's fun to work with because it has this uh, what do you call it spong or something yeah and and uh, uh, I've used what is it Monica help me from Hillesvog the grå Oh, I'm sorry about my English now. Uh, yes, there is an old breed that Hillesvog has made a lot of yarns from. And, white sheep. Yeah, white sheep. Yeah. And uh, uh, there's one more that is very, uh, you get this glance. It's look gloss. It's like, it's very like silk when you, you it, yeah. So I love the Norwegian uh, old sheep uh, yarns. Yeah, because of their strengths and the, yeah, all the and how it keeps you warm and how it uh, stays the way it should supposed to stay. And if you use um, uh, like um, merino, it will die almost, and it was going to be easier destroyed. Then you have to knit it very hard if you use a, a wool that is very soft. So the North Atlantic sheep are much much better. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the, the, some other questions here as well. Um, uh, well, Karen has asked a few questions actually. So, um, is it a single sided fabric as in one side for the public viewing and one side against your body and, and can it be knit in the round? Yeah, this uh, socks here, I've knitted round and then I cut it up. Uh, but you, because if you want it to, to be uh, uh, like knit, uh, we call it rat, the right side and the wrong side. Uh, you call it knit and pearl. <laughs> so uh, if you want it to be like knitted and uh, straight knitted, then I'd like to prefer to go uh, round and round and cut it up if I have to. Uh, but because of it, um, it's uh, you have to knit f hard. You have to 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 strength and dray and yeah so so uh, you can't be loose in 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 your work you have to be uh, it's fast uh, no 
thick no yeah uh, you have to hold it straight yeah very and hard so um yeah so it feels it's not so it's not um if you see here it's you can stretch it so it will stay very yeah it will stay the way it is mm. and um nancy asks uh after the edgings are knit on the 0 0.0075 or up to two millimeters mm. do you knit the main piece on bigger needle sizes or the same size the same size uh mostly or a half an uh, or you can go up no here on the socks we go up but if you make gloves i make the same all the way well it's that's fantastic. Thank you very much in, indeed, uh, Hege. And uh, thanks also for the, the links to uh, where we can get some uh, packs, as it were, to, to try this uh, for ourselves. So that, that's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. And um, now we'll uh, leave Norway behind and move back to North Uist. And uh, is Dana there? I'd just like to say thank you very much to my friends in Norway, Solve Jordal at Osteroy Museum and Monica and Hege. And I think you both did fantastically well, considering you weren't speaking in your own language. And who, as Andrew said, who needs a slide show when you've got an expert on hand with all that knitting just at her feet? <laughs> and here's Dana from US Wool, who's going to tell us all about US Wool. Okay, well, I have to say it's an education sitting here tonight, listening to everybody speak, and I hope I'm not going to just lull you off to sleep with what I have to say about used wool, but I have a, a, a few slides to show just to illustrate our story. Um, and Susanna's just clicking the buttons to get that up just now. That's fab. So um, it's just a little short history at first. I mean, it says there who I am. Um, but I, I think I represent a few other people. I mean, I was involved in the project back in the early days in 2009. Um, so we can probably click to the next, yeah. Um, our location, I think uh, Meg showed a map of the UK earlier just to show our location up in the Hebrides. But um, I remember flying into uh, Bembecula recently and I couldn't resist the opportunity of taking a photo out of the window of the phone because we were just flying over Grimsey, which is the island that the, the used wool is, is built on. And I love this view of the island because you can see how water is dominating our landscape. And I just think, well, it's one of these things where you are here. So you can follow the arrow down to where we are. And as I say, we're in a lovely location right on the shoreline, but it took us a long time to get there and click to the next, yeah. So, you get the sense of the landscape in, in the Outer Hebrides is always sunny, always dry, beautiful blue skies, sheep happily grazing. Um, but, you know, in the foreground here, you see, you know, the white, what traditionally is white sheep. Now, um, obviously, Meg's talking about, was talking about Hebridean flock that she has. Um, but the, really, the predominant breeds that are here are bred for meat. And they're the, the sort of big white sheep, cheviots or blackface or various crosses within that. You can click to the next one. And traditionally, and still happens today, you bag the wool up and it gets sent off to the mainland um, for next to no money for anybody. Um, in fact, in some cases, it costs you to send it away now. Now, back in the 2008, um, we sort of got together, a few of us had this idea that maybe we could do something to turn the tide on this export of wool and make it into something of value. Um, we were all very ambitious at the time and thought we could just cope with everything that was thrown at us. But um, So it was only four or five uh, in the group originally and we realised we had a lot of work to do because trying to sort of set up a, a mill in our area from scratch um, took a lot of time and energy and I'll just click to, yeah. And I'm, 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 I'm racing over about four years of <laughs> hard work and research um, and fundraising um, because to get to this point where we broke ground and started building a foundation took about 
let me think now. We start in 2009, 2010, so this was 2012, December 2012. So it was about three years we took to, three to four years we took to do the development of fundraising and almost a million pounds worth of fundraising went in to, to get in the mill up and built. Um, it wasn't just about building the mill, of course, um, I have to sort of, as you can see now, it just popped up just like that. <laughs> um, we built the production floor first, it was a single story, and then we built the top floor, which you can see is, is the part on the left that the people can come into and the office space is there and the, the, the shop area too. The two little buildings up behind, the, the little stone building and the little green semicircular building behind it, that's our wash house and wool shed. Um, we naively thought we could do everything under one roof when we started the mill and we could do all the processing under one roof. Well, that lasted about a day and then we discovered that we needed to build a shed to store the wool. Um, we had a lot of learning to do about wool um, and I can just, sorry, you're not getting a chance to have a cuppa. Um, in parallel with building the mill, we also had to develop uh, the skills and experience to work in the mill. So we ran a, a training project over about three and a half years where we started just as an introduction to wool for people. And then almost we, lay, we did a, a trail of breadcrumbs where we started with a two day introduction to wool. And then from that group of people who signed up for that, some people signed up for like a 10 week intermediate wool work course. In fact, Meg actually took part in some of that as well. Um, and it was a wee bit more investment of their time. And in a wee bit of reversal of some training, we actually paid people to come and train with us because in some cases, people were having to sort of give up some of their, their day job time. So we felt we had to compensate them for that. So it was almost like a small bursary we were offering. But from that body, um, we were then able to recruit uh, apprentice mill engineers. So, um, and then when we get to that, the, the mill engineering part, um, we also have to talk a wee bit about the machinery that we acquired. So you have to imagine these three things were happening in parallel, building the mill, training the people, and then sourcing the machinery. And we were very lucky to have the services of the man on the left here, putting some effort into moving this piece of kit. His name is Scott Richardson, and he is a Yorkshire based engineer from the north of England. And he is like a machinery broker. And he knew where all this second hand or third hand or even fifth hand machinery was sitting in uh, sheds and barns around the UK. And we got to know about this particular system, which was in a steading building on the west coast of Scotland. And Colin Ferguson, who's the man at the back, had had this in his uh, steading, his barn for a number of years. And it was really probably at the point of um, not being of any use any longer. Um, and we knew we had to spend a lot of time rebuilding and refurbishing it. But it was the size of this machinery that was quite unique. Um, its origins, we believe, is in the late 19th century. Um, uh, because the centre parts of this card system, this is for combing the fibre, are made of wood. And very quickly, as obviously advancements in technology in the 19th century were coming along, they became metal. So we are sort of comfortable about dating this piece to around the late 19th century anyway. There's sadly no date plate on it. Um, like I said, uh, a lot of our trainee engineering time was spent dismembering, <laughs> cleaning and uh, rebuilding our machinery. Um, but because we were running a training course and we did get support from Europe for part of this as well, from European funding, we were able to do sort of very hands on training. So the engineers were able to get real time with machines and then rebuilding them and we did get some assistance we had we brought in specialist engineers from the Harris tweed industry about every three to four months they would come visit and spend some time with their trainees you can probably go to the next yeah 
We also had um, very good assistance from the British Wool Marketing Board. And this gentleman in the white coat uh, is Stephen Ballinger, who is retired now, but had 40 years of experience working with the, the, the board. The British Wool Marketing Board in the UK is the sort of recipient of wool clip from farms and crofts throughout the country. Um, they do come in for quite a bit of, um, shall we say, hard press sometimes um, because they are the recipient of people's wool and they are the people who pay people for their wool clip. Now, I'm not going to get into this debate, it's for another day, but what Stephen was able to offer us was his skill in actually looking at local fleece and what we were able to do with that fleece. Because at day one, we were a bit clueless. We knew one end of the sheep from another, from obviously handling them several years. And everybody, you know, we all have, well, a lot of us involved did have sheep. So we knew that some sheep felt better than others. But beyond that, um, we were a bit clueless. So we spent about two years actually looking at lots of local fleece, figuring out what it could be used for, what's what length of fibre would suit our machinery as well. So there was a lot of testing and development. Um, um, because as I say, you start off with a flock of sheep and we all looked a little like sheep do, a little bit clueless. Um, and we're like, well, what do we do? So day one, I remember even switching on the machinery and what was produced was over twisted, tight, terrible yarn but you know I've still got that on a on a tube and I'll keep it because that was the first ever spun so going from that point to where we are now as I say took a lot of um ingenuity hard work and effort so you can sorry on to the next thing but these are the typical breeds that we use in our spinning um Cheviot and Svartlis which is uh, a Dutch breed that's kind of I mean a bit popular in Scotland Sheep breeds tend to go up and down in popularity. Um, somebody introduces one and it's the best thing ever. And then a few people buy them and then keep them. Then they don't really know what to do. You see some people getting rid of their flocks after a while, but Svarto seems to be hanging around. There's, there's a few cohorts of breeders here who have them. But for us, it's a really good match to Cheviot for blending. It's a staple length, it's the right size, and we use it a lot in our in yard production. So, and then obviously Hebridean, um, we do spin um, a double knitting and an aran in, in Hebridean. We have got better over the years, but our first spin we did with Hebridean, uh, we just put it all in. And this was a big mistake because as Meg has touched on, there is long and short fibre in the Hebridean fleece some very long fiber. And when we put it through our machinery, um, it was, it created an extremely weak yarn because the long fiber just wrapped around our carding rollers and that created a weak right yarn. And it was a weaving yarn and we sent it up to a weaver who then complained to us that it kept breaking. So we thought we were doing the right thing and we clearly weren't, but we have learned from all these trial and errors because it was an unknown territory to us at the time, so you can there. So we do grade fleece quite closely. We, we Originally, when we set out, we had 12 different categories of grade that we would look at and decide what we would do with. That, I have to say, over the years has boiled down to two, <laughs> because, you know, we're only really looking at sort of what we call medium length staple for our yarns, um, which is about, let me do it in metric, 10 to 15 centimetres in length. Um, and it's soft and we're really looking, we produce knitting yarn. So again, we're looking for a yarn that, that's a wool that's going to be soft to touch and handle. So you can, yeah. Uh, we do wash the wool at the mill. Like I said, do you saw the wee building, um, the stone building that we use for the wash house was the old buyer or the old shed that was on the croft. We put a, a very basic roof and a concrete floor in it. Um, but, and these two washing machines, just one you can see here, they take seven and a half kilos of fleece uh, in each wash. Um, with the Hebridean fleece, we have to wash them twice because of the level of grease within them. So we, we, soak, we soak twice and wash once. 
So it's again a bit more time consuming, but we do feel it's worth doing that. Um, we air dry fleece after it's been washed. Uh, we have a system where we have a loft in the upper part of the building. We just spread the fleece out on racks and um, air dry it with dehumidifiers and also Thankfully, we're getting a wee bit more solar gain through our skylights. So again, the, the natural heat coming through the ceiling is helping it dry. So um, down on the mill production floor, the, the piece of machinery you saw uh, Scott Richardson move earlier, this is what it is like now. Um, we adapted it, we extended it to create what we call the feed-in sheet. And as you can see, the fibre that's going in there just now, I would say hand on heart, that's a Hebridean from a look at that. Um, and it's our card set, as I say, it's two parts to it. Um, you can see it working on our website. There's a, a short film which so, shows some of the machinery uh, running. Um, it's it's because it's Victorian, it's belt driven. Um, it's electrically powered, but I think at one time probably was powered from a different energy source than electricity, probably uh, steam or water. Um, we believe it was originally in a mill on the east side of Scotland, um, the Crombie Mill, which if anyone remembers Crombie Coat, um, it certainly was in existence in the, in the 19th century and actually produced a lot of cloth for um, the, I think, the Confederate Army in the American Civil War. So whether this sample card was ever used in production of that, who knows. But anyway, we believe that's what its origin was, but it's certainly a good watercourse for us. You can, okay. um, our spinning frame is a little bit more recent. It's 1959 in its origin. And like that, we had to completely rebuild it from scratch um, and adapt it for our purposes. It's for those who like a little bit of technical detail, it's ring spinning. Um, it's a very compact machine and I found the instructions on how to build it in an archive in the north of England in, and it, I think it's the way it was written it sounded like it would have been sent overseas and then the crate would arrive and then you would open the crate and build the machine yourself. This is the way it was written in the instruction. And I'm fairly confident that this is the type of compact machine that probably did get exported overseas. But we were very lucky to get it. Um, and again, it is a it's a workhorse for us. Um, and you can yeah, put on to the next thing. So you can see our shop now. You can see we we don't do any dyeing. Um, we do natural blending. Um, we predominantly produce knitting yarn, um, some weaving yarn that we then either sell directly or commission. A cloth to be woven from, um, have a tweed or scarves or wraps or blankets. Uh, we try and work with sole traders or small businesses that are a bit like ourselves, who are maybe based in a rural, rural area or who are, um, I should say, trying to find, just do something a little bit different. Um, our output is not large, or, I mean, we're time being commercial, but it's we are a community business um, and set up as a Scottish charity as well with educational aims. So we try and dovetail some of that in with obviously some of the commercial production as well. You can hit the button. Thanks. So, and this is a wee bit close up of some of our sort of core range of knitting yarn. Um, we, I mean, what can I say about it? I hope some of you have used it. Uh, I'm seeing some of it around here. In fact, Susanna, who's sitting beside me, is wearing some of it. I'm wearing some of it. Um, it's we do online, we export, we do a bit of wholesale. Um, you know, there are challenges to running a, a small business like ours, uh, where we're located, um, and we just have to bend with the wind. There are four of us who work there now, um, a mix of full time and part time, and it's you know it this. The last two to three years have been very challenging for us, but we will we'll keep on ploughing away. Um, and you can just jump to the next, yeah. Um, we also commission, other people are interested in working with our yarn, will commission patterns um, to design their own pieces of work, or we'll sorry, uh, commission people to do patterns for us. Um, we don't have a huge stock of in-house patterns, it's time consuming to do and, uh, you know, I, I wish I wish we could have more time to do it. 
Um, this is one sweater by uh, a lady called Flora Kennedy, who trades us in her wild. And she designed three sweaters for us. And this she, she based on the idea of seaweed floating on water. And we asked, the, asked her to do two designs and she produced three because she said this one was just in her head and she wanted just to do it for us, which was very good of her. Uh, but next, yeah. The most recent one she's done, and I think it was a wee bit inspired by the fact that Meg said that you were talking about cloaks and, and coverings here. So this is the most recent one that we've had done for us by, by Flora at Inner Wild, and it's a shawl using a lace weight. Now, our lace weight is probably a little bit more vibrant and, dare I say, um, heavier weight than some lace weights I've seen on the market. But for us, it was a little bit of a departure to try it. Um, so we designed this, uh, and in fact, I, I have it with me, but I don't know if you can see it or not. Is it? Uh, got on? No, no, I'm, I'm actually wearing it for <laughs> the, the actual screen. <laughs> there you go, thank you. Sorry, disappearing from screen there. Yeah. Um, you might not be able to see no, they won't, yeah. Well, maybe when we come off, off my talk, I'll, I'll be able to show you, but the the this project you knit with one one skein or one ball of yarn from start to finish. Um, so it's like a, a, a complete project in one. Um, but it's a it's a lovely loose wrap, and I think I'm, I'm very pleased with the the way she's done it. Um, it's been very popular, thanks to you. Yeah, and also we've had some other designers who've kind of surprised us sometimes by coming visiting us and buying some of our yarn and then producing wonderful patterns. And this is by um, Elizabeth Doherty, who oh, uh, trades as Blue Bee, Blue Bee Studio and is based in America. And this pattern was incredibly popular. We sold an amazing amount of yarn um, to produce this. And I know she's worked with uh, Meg as well on, on some patterns here too. So, and that was unannounced in a way it was she approached us and asked and we were just delighted and i say it's been an incredibly popular pattern for us um yeah also to diversify a little bit i've mentioned harris tweed it's a very strong brand associated with the outer hebrides but i'm very pleased that the first tweed we did do was in hebridean and i remember getting the news to say that i was at the north east agricultural show and uh, I got a phone call to say that our tweed had received this orb stamp certification. And I just felt I, I was a wee bit overwhelmed because it's taken us a long time and it was a long journey to get to this point. But um, we now commissioned commissioned tweeds and obviously have them made up into um, accessories so people can buy the cloth for, for making into their own garments. Uh, the weaver we use is just there's nobody weaving Harris Street in, in our immediate area, but we, we sent it over to the neighbouring island in Harris, and there's a very excellent weaver there. She's um, Rebecca Hutton, and she does, and we're very lucky to have her. She's like the closest Harris Tweed weaver to us. We do have a ferry journey to get to her, but we like the idea that it's crossing water. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that at all. <laughs> Next. Um, so again, looking at some of the other things that we're doing, we, we commission the weavers on the Isle of Mull to do blankets and scarves for us, and also a very specialist uh, weaver on the east side of Scotland to do um, large wraps and throws with a, a particular breed that's not from the Outer Hebrides, but it's from one farm in Aberdeenshire. So we do take fibre from out with the Outer Hebrides because there's not so many coloured sheep or alpaca here. So we, we take very specific quantities of coloured fleece from about five different farms on the, on the mainland of Scotland. Um, but that's about it. On to the next, yeah. We also do commissions for people. Um, we do about two a year. We're mainly producing yarn for our own brand, but we'll do, I say, a maximum of two to three commissions, spinning commissions, for individuals a year. It's expensive for them to do. It's quite a big commitment. Um, it's time, you know, it's, it's our, anyway, it's important for us to offer it. 
And again, it's either people who've got a croft or farm business who are looking to diversify. And as I say, this was uh, a lady in neighbouring island of Harris who's a weaver. So we spun some of her Hebridean flock into a weaving yarn that she ultimately is going to weave into to cloth and then sell. So, yeah. Now, here's some shameless marketing on our part. Um, we're doing a 15% off. Now, ignore the discount code. I've made it very easy for you. It's automatically applied at checkout and it's called April Joy because <laughs> I just felt I needed some April, April Joy now the sun is out. So it's valid until the end of the month. Anyway, you can just at the end. Um, so uh, I I could talk about you spool for hours, and I'm I'm really ashamed that I I haven't come as well prepared as Meg had with beautiful props and a, and a magnificent cloak to wear. Um, but you know I'm happy to talk individually about the anything we've been doing at the mill. Um, come and see us anytime. Um, we're we're open <laughs> all year round, and uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, you can show your skin. Oh, I can show my skin of wool now. There it is. There, it's called Hecla. It's like a lovely sort of single. It's a to say a single ply lace weight, um, and it's a joy to. And I've knit. I'm now on my third one actually. Although I'm, this is my project at the moment. If it's show and tell time, it's another lace weight we did, just a, a very limited edition. Um, so I'm using the same pattern, but just uh, you can see it's lacy. There you go, lace weight. Um, and I'm having fun doing because normally I use chunky yarns or double knitting. Um, so doing something with a lace weight, I think I need to get my 0.75 millimeter needles um, to hand. So I'll definitely be ordering some of them. <laughs> So can you see the questions? That Not very well. Oh, the wrong glasses. Yeah. So me. the first one is, what do you use when you wash the fleece? Um, yeah, we tested a lot of things. Um, we we bought very expensive samples of wool washing um, liquid from America, and we were like, Ooh, well, it sort of worked. It was fine. Um, you know what we use now? Um, it's washing up detergent from a company called. BioD, so it's a, a biodegradable washing up liquid. Um, you can buy commercially. We buy it in, you know, ten liter containers, you know, by the pallet. Um, but you can buy it in your stores locally, certainly in the UK, and it's probably overseas as well. Um, and we feel that that actually works the best um, for soaking the wool first in hot water. Let that drain out and then let the, the, the wool washing machine go through its cycle with more detergent. It only needs about 200 ml, millilitres dilute in water and about a litre, and then a save works a treat. Um, and the other question was about the rebuild of the yeah. mill equipment. Um, the, just so it's an incredible task. And did you document the rebuild? Uh, in photographs, yes. We were too busy to think about video. I think I did some video. Um, but we were, you know, there was a, we were juggling a lot at the time, and I certainly took a lot of photographs of what's in work in progress. Um, and, you know, I wasn't in the mill all the time because I was in an office doing a lot of administration and um, working on computers. So the stuff I was doing was not on the production floor, but I, I, I did take a lot of photographs. Uh -huh. And uh, Helen's wondering if we're still using Beaumont or if you're still using Beaumont in yarns. Yes, we use we use uh, the Scottish Beaumont. As I say, it's from one particular farm in uh, Aberdeenshire that we buy it from. Um, and we've this a lovely couple, uh, Strachans, who've campaigned and really championed the breed for many, many years. Um, and we buy their wool clip. Um, they were struggling to find an outlet for it, and it's a very specific breed that was sort of almost a genetic um, development from Merino and Shetland. And uh, the project was done in the 1990s, and these kind of research flocks were then either retained or dispersed after the project ended. And so they still have one of, you know, I think one of the original, well, obviously it's not the original sheep because they've long passed on, but you know. 
the 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 flock is they, they maintained their flock over these years. So it's a lovely wool to work with. It works very well on our machinery. Uh, we do a knitting yarn and also a weaving yarn that we commission into the scarves and wraps. So yeah, I, I love it. In fact, that is Beaumont, what I'm working with just now in that lace weight. So yeah, we love it. Um, there's a quick question about the hand warmer pattern that you should, showed in the first pattern slide, and is that available to come to visit? Uh, that is by a designer called Joanne Allport. So if you, so we don't market that, that was her own design. We sent her the yarn and then she does a lot of pattern development for a knitting magazine. So the designer's name is Joanne Allport. And if you search her or she's on Ravelry, um, you'll be able to find it directly from her. So we, we don't we don't retail that pattern. Um, she just used it to promote, you know, we got the promotion of the yarn through it. So and mm -hmm. Annie's wondering, can you save the lanolin and make a product or no. utilize it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> we don't we don't we don't wash enough. I mean, um, we looked at early, in early days we actually looked and at the science of capturing it, but to be quite honest, we we wouldn't we're not washing enough to to do that. Um, it's it's a diversification that we just it was going to not really work for us. No. And do you find the temperature of the weather affects the fleece in any way? Uh, uh, the only time it affects us is obviously when um, it's cool and damp. <laughs> it takes longer to dry. That's all. Um, our temperature variation isn't too great here. We're, we're, you know, there's not a, there's, it doesn't get too cold or too hot very much. So um, we know that it's it's just when it's really wet, it just takes longer to dry. It takes two, three days, you know, three to four days. Whereas in like a day like today, when it's dry, humidity is low, um, you you know, it'll dry within a couple of days, sometimes a day. So. That's that's all really. Dan, I'm wondering if what they actually mean is the, yeah. the quality of the fleece on the sheep being affected by the weather rather than. Oh, I see. Sorry. <laughs> it's the sheep. There's, there's so many different stages of production, and I'm thinking, oh, which one? Um, yeah, obviously, weathering. I mean, wool on an animal, it's designed there to protect it. And I think. When we look at a fleece, you can tell where, I mean, what affects a fleece for us, not so much, is not the weather, it's the condition of the animal. Um, it's the health of the animal. Uh, and that's sometimes very clear in the, the quality of the wool that is produced. Also, how that animal has been looked after, what kind of land it's grazing on, um, if it's in a harsh terrain. So things like that, that can affect what's in the fleece, because you know, a sheep that's kind of happily wandering in the moor will pick up a lot of heather and sphagnum debris, which is fine. But if you're trying to get that out of a fleece and not cultivate through to your yarn, that's that's a challenge. So we have to just remove that completely. So um, so yeah, it's I don't know if that answers somebody's question. I feel like I've diverged into a different mm -hmm. era there, but um, yeah. I don't I don't think it really affects us. You don't want to work with damp fleece because that's just going to degrade. And you know, we've we've had to in the early days we've had to dispose of a lot of fleece that arrived with us, which was wet, I and mean, we just can't process that. So yeah, that's that very enthusiastic people. I don't oh. think that's the other thing. I'm wearing my own glasses, I can't read small. <laughs> I'll have to save it and pass it off. Sorry. Really no, amazing. but I, as I say I wouldn't bore people anymore. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Dana. That's uh, that's a great story, a success story. It's it's wonderful. And uh, you, if you had your other glasses on, you'd be able to see that there's a quite a number of people there in the chat saying that they love your uh, they love your wool and they they use it uh, for knitting, um, gansies and all sorts of all sorts of things. And that there some of them are going to come and be visiting you soon uh, <laughs> as well. So. <laughs> Yes. So great stuff. So we have uh, we've got just ten minutes uh, left, and uh, what we did in Newfoundland was that we had um, we asked the people who were sitting knitting to tell us a little bit about themselves and why they they love knitting. So I wonder if um, Meg could uh, introduce us to 
the knitters. Okay. Yes, they're all primed and raring to go. <laughs> um, I don't know, the only thing is a technical challenge of actually seeing people. Will, will the owl? I think as you speak, the owl sees you. Okay, so maybe Katrina, I know that you've brought some very special sweaters to talk about that are distinctly from here, which I think is important to talk about. So, okay. Um, and again, before we start, can I say that I am no expert. I'm learning as I go along and changing things as I go along, but here in Uist, we have a particular type of Gansey, which is unique to Uist, and it's the Eriski Gansey. And I suspect there are people out there who know more about it than I do. Mm -hmm. I suspect there's one person at least <laughs> reading the name. Um, but I won't put that person on the spot. <laughs> so very quickly, um, I'm going to um, tell you what I think makes an Eriki Gansi unique. Like most Gansies, it's knitted in the round, um, double always on double pointed needles because the circular needle doesn't achieve the same tension or the correct tension. It's knitted with a sport weight tool, which is five ply, which is sourced from, well, certainly the Eriski knitters sourced it from Cornwall, from, from Japan mm -hmm. um, yarns. I've knitted a couple, I've only been knitting uh, Eriski sweaters for the last couple of years. Um, and I've knit, I'm on my third one at the moment, but I have diversified and I've included some of the patterns into socks and gloves and different things because it's very easy to do. It's so mathematical, it's numerate, it's just a matter of counting stitches, uh, knits and purls, and it is literally all knit and purl. It looks very elaborate, but it's pretty straightforward. Or they uh, is that Diane? Diane, is that you? Fifteen <laughs> <laughs> group in which word you meet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll go through all the questions. There's a few. Yeah. yeah. So uh, here's, a, here's a couple I made earlier. Um, <laughs> just, 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 just. <laughs> the Eriski um, is uh, the Gansey has an all-over pattern, and that's what makes it unique. It is very elaborate, it's very interesting. Can you see it? Is your way getting it any closer? I don't know. It's awkward. Let's see if it can go. Maybe. Let's just see the detail. Yeah. Another thing that coffee. makes it really attractive is that with the air escape, there is no uh, sewing involved, which appeals to a lot of people. <laughs> it's knitted in the round. Um, the main body. Uh, is knitted. There are panels, usually 13 stitch panels, and in between each panel, there is uh, there are channels which run. So it's knitted in the round all the way up to the up just under the arms, and then um, there's a piece which is called the netting. And that again is knitted in the round. And then, then after that, it's split, and the front and the back of the yoke are knitted um, on on in, separately. And these panels in the yoke are bigger; they're seventeen sti seventeen stitch panels. Most of the Eriski sweaters were knitted by women for their men folk. So they contain a lot of personal patterns. Um, the personal patterns can be things like the marriage lines, which a woman always knitted into her husband's sweater. Um, and then the diamonds, the heart and the home diamond and various ones. And then the other patterns are mostly sea related, ropes, anchors, flags, harbour steps, waves, and also um, something peculiar to Eriski uh, are the horseshoes, which is the Eriski pony, which is a bit of pony, again, which is unique to Eriski. Uh, the neck, the, the shoulders, shoulder straps were knitted. They were quite often land related, like run rigs or like furrowed field. And then once the shoulder straps were knitted and 
they were grafted onto the back. The sleeves were knitted down. And the sleeves also on the escape were heavily patterned, usually three quarters of the sleeves were heavily patterned. And um, the beauty of knitting them down was because the sleeves were the first part of the Genzi to actually wear out, and it was easy to unravel and re-knit them. Mm -hmm. So they were, it was a working garment. Um, and apparently, the lady who is credited to, um, if not inventing the Gansey, certainly creating the first one and gathering all the patterns was a lady called Annie O'Henley, who was one of the herring girls, probably oh, 140, 150 years ago. And she travelled from Eriskay all around the coast of Scotland, right down to Great Yarmouth, where all the herring girls would knit in the evenings and at any other time. They used to share patterns, whilst each town retained its own particular patterns. They often shared. And apparently what she did was she gathered up all the patterns she could and she devised the Eriski, which is by far the most elaborate. <laughs> Um, so there's a few questions specifically about the Eriske ones. Um, so someone's asked, uh, is there a pattern available? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> there, are, there are books, um, and I mean, I can recommend a couple that I found uh, useful. There are, there are some books available, but there, there's no pattern as such. It was passed down. And at the moment, there, there's a workshop in Eriske. From time to time, they run workshops with the with the native Eriski ladies who knit, passing on the patterns and the techniques. But yes, there are a couple which I can. I mean, Di Gilpin's Di Gilpin. Di Gilpin. published a, a recent book yes. which had Gansey pattern parts. Certainly, Di Gilpin's book is really, really good. And then there's another one by an American lady who has a double barrel name Ruth. I can't remember her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but certainly if you Google it, I'm sure you'll find it. So they are useful. There are lots of books on Gansies, but not many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there is also a point of like wondering if didn't men know how to knit as well? And I think yes. I've heard this of them yes. fixing their own cuffs. They did. Yeah, and quite often the fishermen would knit as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, someone's asked about my jumper as well. It's made in USO metal. And there's not really a pattern, it's just kind of jumper shaped. <laughs> so I just um, to jump in and say Susanna is the rebel in the knitting group. She doesn't follow a pattern. She makes it all up and writes it all down. And then, um, yeah, she's a trained textile person, a complete rebel. She keeps us young, though. Expand <laughs> the demographic place. Yeah. So, and lastly, Lisa, we're just going to jump to Lisa. We're just about to run out of time. Lisa brought her spinning. I think I'll see my hat. There we go. And is that from scratch? That's, yeah. So that's Tibiot, local Bernadine, Tibiot wool, hand dyed, spun and knit. Here we are. What a talent. Could you just pass the hat around a little bit? Because it was just on the edge. I haven't found it yet. Oh, there it is. And she sells from her crop. <laughs> so if you're a part of the country, I have to put it here but it's so Very soon she'll have her own wool shed. Isn't it fabulous? That's that that fabulous. Yeah. It's so squishy. <laughs> Great. Okay, I think I think we're, we're, I think we're done for here. Yeah. Well. I'd just like to say thank you very very much to everybody that contributed this evening. I found it fascinating, and it's been. Great to hook up with my old friends in Norway as well, and and the technology held, so that was fantastic. It did, didn't it? Well, yes, I'd like just like to thank everyone as well. What a fantastic uh, evening! Um, I know I've learned a, a tremendous amount, and uh, it's just been so fascinating to see the the different traditions and yet the similarities across uh, the the North Sea. Um, it's uh, very uh, it's it's mind opening and. Um, it's, it just shows the value of uh, this University of the Arctic idea, uh, networking people together so that we can share ideas and stories and see uh, what we're all up to.
and you know it'll get inspired uh, from each other so yes definitely a very inspiring evening and uh, a very high bar for the third uh, yarns and yards event which we will be uh, organizing soon and i am looking at laurie here because i know laurie wants to organize one from prince edward island so uh, thanks again everyone and um, enjoy your knitting and uh, there will be a recording of this available on the institute for northern studies uh, website and um, uh, we will see you at the next yarns and yarns event <laughs>